Order. Welcome to our witnesses, uh, Rachel Caldicott uh, and uh, Sally Sphere Tate, um, who are giving evidence uh, to our inquiry into digital regulation. Uh, we're focusing on how the regulators join up and coordinate their work, um, how they look to the future as well as react to uh, issues that you know, are, are in the public domain now, and also the relationship of the regulators with Parliament and parliamentary oversight. Um, and uh, Rachel and Sally, thank you very much indeed for, for coming and giving us uh, evidence today. Uh, the session will be uh, broadcast online and a transcript will be taken. Um, uh, Rachel Caldicott is an all-round expert on the, um, uh, on the social impact of new and emerging technologies, uh, Director of Research at Careful Industries and has held a number of roles uh, in, in, in um, uh, the sector in recent years um, and uh, she was the founding CEO of Dot Everyone, um, uh, an organisation that was very early on um, in the debate about the responsible use of technology and its societal impact. Uh, Sally Sphere Tate is the Chief Executive Officer of, of Regulation, a solicitor and a barrister and has held a variety of roles um, in the financial services industry and uh, uh, in the sector too. So two uh, excellent witnesses to help us uh, shed some light on the issues that we are discussing today. Um, do, if you want to, um, in, 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 your, in response to the opening question, add any further points about your background or, or any initial thoughts that might be helpful. But let's get stuck into the first question, which come from Baroness Buscombe. Thank you, and welcome both of you, Rachel and Sally. Um, the first question, it's, it, it could be almost like, how long is a piece of string? It's, it's, um, but it, it, it makes me happy in a way, because 10 years ago, I had the audacity to suggest um, publicly that we may at some point need to regulate the online world. And I was thinking particularly um, about young children. And I was lambasted from here to Hades, particularly uh, by the media and journalists in particular, so I think we're in a better place now that we accept that there has to be some form of regulation, but we also want to make sure that we don't stifle innovation. So what do you think will be the biggest challenges for digital reg regulation over the next 10 years? And I have a second part to the question, which I think it's probably better if I ask both parts first, but we can interject as it were. How can regulation keep pace with developments in technology? Because the two are intertwined, aren't they? You can't really discuss one without the other. Um, Rachel, let me ask you first. Thank you. Um, yes, and, I, and I'll add that I'm a, a, a um, non-exec at Ofcom, but I'm not here to represent Ofcom at all. Um, and so I suppose this is something I think about a, a, a lot, and we're clearly at a moment when things seem to be mm. moving at pace. But currently, it feels like there's a lot of fairly atomized energy. So the thing that's happening now, and if I begin with what's happening now, in order to think about how to look ahead, is on the one hand, we're thinking um, about harms, individual harms that are arising, consequences. And we're looking at very specific uh, technologies, but we're not thinking about how or why. Um, and if we if we look at what's happened over the last maybe three months, think about the rate at which a new story about a harm comes out, uh, probably weekly, if not daily, occasionally. I think that that uh, uh, shows us that really. The way to regulate is not to think about what has happened, but to think about what will. And so I would say um, it's much more important to think about the world that we um, want to um, live in and the role of technology in that and how technology can make a positive difference rather than constantly going after the bad. Because the thing that isn't happening at the moment is... No one's really talking about how it, it ought to be, only 
how it's all absolutely awful. Mm. And that actually, not only is there a sort of imaginative piece there to think about um, potential, but if we think about what's happened over the last um, year and a half, and all the ways that technologies that were created for one thing have been used for another. So Zoom has become a, 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 a school, a, a dance class, a, a church hall. If we'd have taken the, the approach to regulating that I think is coming out in the online... Uh, the safety bill... Um, everybody would be up in arms because no one had thought about how to regulate uh, online uh, 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 dance classes uh, or, you know, like there's not really thinking about the, the way that technology turns into the things that we need. And so I suppose the first part of that is to sort of look ahead and not continue to look back. The, a, a second part, just to your point about how do you keep up, I think keeping up is much more about uh, 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 creating the pace as opposed to running along afterwards. And I think that if we can think about what are the mechanisms to not just instrumentally regulate whether it's content, data, privacy, algorithms, but to articulate above that the kind of world that technology is able to play a role in and then um, the centrevise uh, good. I think there's a real opportunity there. Okay, thank you. And in fact, I, that's incredibly um, optimistic, so I like what I'm hearing from you, Rachel. Um, I, I, you know, in the sense that we've, we tend to be very reactive, and I think some of us are quite concerned that the online harms bill, uh, people are going to have such extraordinary expectations about that the, it can cure the problem, which those of us who uh, know something about this world know that that's a big ask, and it's probably not possible. Um, so better to think much more deeply about the possibilities of what we want to have which, which, um, and how we can innovate to achieve that, which sounds much more practical. Um, so, uh, Sally, you, to you, um, from a legal standpoint, just obviously those first two questions, but um, would you agree with others that, um, from a legal standpoint, the law is all going <coughs> to be behind the curve? So it's um, perhaps a, a mix of law, codes of practice, as, as other forms of regulation have been, uh, self-regulation, which I have to say I'm a huge fan of, uh, have always been. So um, your take on it, if I may, as a lawyer, which may be <coughs> different to Rachel. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of background about me. So I've been general counsel, head of compliance, um, I've been a regulator and I've been a partner in a law firm and most of it was in financial services. So I come with that background. I transitioned into technology through University College London where I'm a research associate in 2018. And uh, the company that we established is one that develops technology infrastructure. So that journey took me down the route of understanding technology in depth interacting with technologists on a daily basis. So I come with knowledge from those two um, areas. Um, let me tackle the f the, your third question first, and then I'll come back to the challenges. Um, the law does have to come from society, yes. So it, it always has to, has to follow. But society also has a... Um, a duty to start to self-regulate. Mm -hmm. And we see this emerging already, I think, in the US, in Europe. There's, um, if you haven't um, found them, the Center for Humane Technology in the US is, is, a, is quite a well-known initiative. And <clears throat> so from that perspective, I think I 
quite like the self-regulating approach as a starting point where, where while everybody who's involved in regulation gets to understand the business aspect of it, the economic aspect of it, the societal aspect of it, because it's quite complex. Um, and that education process, to me, is also one of the ten one of the challenges for the next ten years, because we're. I didn't know much about technology. All I knew was that I interacted with my customers, who were banks, who were regulators, and they would ask me questions about how do I implement blockchain, how do I deal with cryptocurrencies, mm -hmm. and I was advising them as a lawyer. It's not until I went on that journey of interacting with technologists on a daily basis they un that I understood how complex technology is and how quickly it moves, and mostly how interconnected it is. So one thing that most people probably don't think about, but I do think about on a daily basis because of that, is the reason that deep fakes exist, the reason that we're able to, the, the, the visual um, AI is so powerful is because it came out of a need for protecting people in security forces, in you know, MI6, etc. There was a lot of money that went into it, into developing it, because it was intended to keep us safe. There was also a lot of um, images that were available on the internet for AI to learn from. And that was necessary and that really helped with the development of the technology. But any good development of technology will always have the reverse size of the coin. And, and that's going to be one of the challenges and it's also with keeping pace. Now how do we address that is one of the things that I always think about as well. So the technology is going to be continuously changing. We need to have on the side of the regulators a new breed of individuals who understand technology fundamentally because a procurement process is never going to give you the reality of what is in academia. Mm -hmm. So, and, and keeping academia close by is also something that happens, but we need to find a governance structure to be able to make to be able to ensure that those pockets of knowledge within the regulators, the different agencies actually share that knowledge at all levels, not just at the top level, because I think there's a lot of sharing that happens at the higher levels, but not at the level of the troops. So the education piece is, is one of the challenges, I guess that's for the next 10 years. The other side of it is that we've got to be careful not to open up too much or to close too much. And that's a very difficult balance to strike. And trying to strike it in a, in a wholesale approach is probably not going to get us there because it becomes too cumbersome to deal with. Um, finally, yeah. sorry, <laughs> um, on the macro side. So again, this is with my, not with my technology hat on, but with my regulator hat on. So financial services is, is quite advanced when it comes to regulation. And that's because there are international standard setters. And at the, at the international standard setting level, there are principles that get set and then that get implemented. I don't think we're there on the technology side. It's still starting, so therefore everybody is discovering at the same time, which then, then it, and, and then in a world of competitive advantage of whoever implements um, digital, let's call them policies for now, it becomes a lot, um, it requires a lot of effort, let's just put it that way. So these are the challenges from a macro and micro. Can I just come back quickly on um, one thought I'm having listening to you both? So one uh, form of regulation, self-regulation, which to my mind has worked well over a period of years is advertising regulation. One of the reasons it's worked and it continues to work is because it comes with a cost so if the person who is the advertiser uh, falls foul of regulations that they themselves develop, <clears throat> oversee, and, and are involved with, they um, suffer financially, economically. So perhaps as well as the need for more people who really do understand technology, it's, it's important for them to keep close to people who understand governance and regulation so that if they work together, um, it creates um, quite good tensions on both sides in terms of the need 
for everything that you do to ensure that you understand the consequences, um, which I think is one of the reasons why, as I say, uh, advertising is quite a good model. A self-regulating ecosystem is certainly a, a really good way of dealing with it because... Um, the industry self-regulates better when, when, when the right governance is in place, obviously. Mm. Um, everybody feels the pain, everybody feels the benefit. Yeah. Um, and they will, instead of having the regulator against the industry, it becomes industry self-regulating. So that is definitely a good model, especially to begin with when it's a very technical subject. Yeah. Rachel, you would... I would add that, that there's, it's slightly different because sometimes... The thing that we're trying to, the, the, you know, so if we think about online content, for instance, what a lot of the online, uh, the safety bill is trying to regulate is online content. But the content is, to be honest, neither here nor there. The thing that matters is the business model behind it mm. and the intent of the business model. And so if you have a company whose aim is to somehow change the behaviour of a user and maybe that is changing their behaviour by encouraging, encouraging them to spend more time on their uh, 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 service, to share their content, to contribute. If what we're regulating is the effect of that, then actually self-regulating will only ever move particularly the larger technology companies into different outcomes and I think here one of the complexities is the importance of regulating business models regulating the the underlying aims which sounds uh, fantastic in a way and 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 so I think it's that kind of complexity that is the difference between advertising and online. Okay, that's very helpful. Just to follow on that, <clears throat> speaking of standard setters, I would encourage you to look at the uh, Center for Humane Technology. They published recently as a result of the Facebook um, recent testimony, a framework for how self-governance would um, take place. And it, it tackles, I think there are seven recommendations, seven points. One of them is external legislation or regulation, which is government imposed. The other six are internal, business model related, ethics related, etc. Um, so th there, there is thinking around that model. Yeah. Yep. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Rachel. I just want to come back on on, on the point that you made. Baroness Buscom, you know, asked you, how do we look to the future? How do we, how important is horizon scanning? And you made quite a, an interesting point, and it's a way I've not looked at it before. We've always thought about horizon scanning as looking for future problems and addressing them through regulation. And you said, no, it's about looking for future opportunities as well, really understanding <coughs> what technology can positively, positively do for society as well as what problems it may bring to society. Um, so I see how you, apply, um, how you apply insight into potential future harms, take a view as to what needs to be done to address it, whether you need a, a self-regulatory, a co-regulatory or a, a regulatory approach and how that might work. Um, have you thought about how that horizon scanning that identifies future positive opportunities, particularly societal ones, how that insight is used? Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's, there's a number of, I suppose, um, techniques that one can use. I'm actually running a program at the moment where we're working with people who work in um, charities and civil, the society to um, look forward to 2050 and beyond and then um, backcast to now how to get to those outcomes. You know, and So there's an extent to which I think a lot of the time if the lens you are using is technology, then you're only really going to be thinking about technically mediated uh, possibilities. And if you know it, and that really comes out to me when we look at um, the government paper. Uh, I think it's called, I don't know, regulating in a 
Digital World, which came out in June, has three categories in there, um, which I've noted, actually, because I'm going to get them wrong. One of them is about competition. One of them is about... Uh, 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 about uh, uh, safety, and the last is about um, a um, flourishing democratic uh, society. But under that lever, it's all media um, um, and a little bit of privacy. But it's not really thinking about, for instance, the role that uh, algorithms have in financial harms. It's not thinking about the, the way our working lives are changing about how we're educated. Like, it's not thinking about those uh, softer things. And I would really encourage, really, thinking about domains, whether it's housing, whether it's transport, whether it's healthcare, and then looking at the role technology plays there, rather than, I, th- I think it's very easy to get like very hung up on the specifics of well you know could an algorithm do this or this or this or to even i think you know there's a there's a huge industry that exists to make us believe that for instance uh, uh um it's possible to achieve, uh, achieve a general artificial intelligence who knows maybe it's not you know, and and that actually, what tends to happen is, the the more technocratic narratives tell us about what the technology can do, not about what we would like it to do. And I think there's a role for both of those. Very interesting. I agree. That's a, that's, a, that's a very useful point. Um, uh, Baroness Reberg. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting thus far. I think we're going to be talking a lot about horizon scanning because my questions are about horizon scanning. Um, we've read a lot of evidence um, and acknowledgement um, that new digital business models can be introduced very quickly, whether, and just as you've said, legislation you know, trails a bit behind. Um, when we took evidence from members of the DRCF, they talked about needing to scan the horizon more effectively, both individually and collectively, um, and also in cross-departmental teams, um, which is a new initiative of theirs. Um, and yet this activity is time-consuming, and finding the right resource is also challenging. So my first question is, is about that and your perspective on that, and then I'll come into academia, which you've touched upon, and, uh, and, and, and other matters in a second. So, Sally, should we start with you? Okay, sure. Um, Yes, it is time-consuming. And first, you have to define what you're scanning the horizon for. Uh, Are you scanning for um, changes in technology that are going to potentially impact behavior? Are you... It's it's an open question, which is therefore going to require a lot of resources. How do you do that? you have to start from a base of having enough people in, uh, uh, pragmatically at least, um, enough people around the room who have a good understanding of certain areas. And then you can grow from there. So Because you, you, unintended consequences are impossible to predict. Um, so I would say that very long-term horizon scanning might not be the most useful thing to do. So 20, 50, 20 years, Google is how many years old? Facebook is how many years old? We could not have imagined teenage suicide as a result of Facebook. We could not have imagined Facebook when um, the iPhone started. Mm. I think in the world, excuse me, in the world of digital horizon scanning is a little bit... uh, we might be aiming for something that we can't achieve. Let's just put it that way. So would you be looking to suggest we should we should restrict ourselves to the two or three years? I would. I would. I would say that the more important um, the a, a framework for experimentation would probably gather knowledge at the level of everybody and and build the knowledge so that you can have pockets of knowledge that just go and find things out for themselves. Um, 
institutionally, we, we do not have the rice governance frameworks in place that encourage um, experimentation. We think a lot, we don't experiment enough. And, and the, the, the experience that you get through experimentation is absolutely unique. And it's not one-to-one. -one. It's not a person who has read a report. It's the entire group that was involved in the experiment that gains that knowledge. And if we do that through, in, in a way that forms lots of clusters, it, again, it's an ecosystem way of lots of people scanning the horizon through bilateral conversations and then sharing that knowledge. So I'd say experimentation as a mechanism for horizon scanning short-term leading to long-term. And the best way to pull all this all this together? Um, there are pockets of innovation that happen in the public sector. Um, often they're constrained by time and budget and by the individuals involved in the experimentation having a full-time job and being extremely stretched. So I think in financial services we talk about the tone at the top. So if the tone at the top is permissive of experimentation and of failure within a contained environment because experimentation does include failure and closing a door and knowing that something cannot be done is as important as opening a door so um it, i think there's a deloitte study that um they call it at the edge which is allowing people to experiment while ring fencing the organization but giving them a real framework and a budget and the ability to experiment and that would be a way of understanding where technology could go for themselves. Right, thank you. Rachel? Um, I think I have a rather different uh, opinion. I mean, I think a lot of things that happen that we don't expect are a lot more um, mundane than we imagine. You know, so I've been working in technology since the late 90s um, as someone who ran a community of a couple of hundred thousand you know, girls online in the late 90s, I could have told you definitely that any technology that comes along will expedite chat, um, the way that people talk about eating disorders and self-harm, you know, absolutely. But I couldn't have told you that QR codes would be absolutely everywhere in the last year. You know, like the more... In, and, and so actually I think we can definitely speak with quite a lot of confidence to those much larger trends and it's the but we don't know exactly how it will look you know and I think there's something about <clears throat> kind of what level of um, fidelity do you need to have to understand um, the future and it's not knowing, I don't know, exactly what the interface is likely to be. You know, it's not a um, minority report kind of world. But thinking about what happens when you give people access to information? What is likely to happen when you give people a voice who've never had a voice? You know, these aren't extraordinary things to think about. And I suppose one of the... A th a th a th things in, in in kind of trying to champion a little bit more of a formalised approach to this kind of a thing at Dot Everyone we created a toolkit that product teams could use to start thinking about the unintended consequences of the products they were making because the thing that would very often happen is you know you are tasked with making a, a feature that brings users to the site more often or they spend longer on there. But you aren't asked to think about what the environmental impact of that is. You're not asked to think about um, what the, uh, the, the impact would be if everybody uh, started doing it. You're not... You know, you know, they're like that. Actually, a lot of the time, technology is understood only through the lens of the business case, and so I think there's a huge opportunity. And I suppose just to pick up the start of your question, I don't think it's really hard, and I don't think it takes a huge, a huge amount of time. But uh, 
exactly as, as uh, uh, Sally said earlier, it's having people who can think about technology side by side with people who can think about governance mm. in order that those two things can play out together, I think is the really important part. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, on the one hand, I, I completely agree with you that, you know, when, when you were looking at your community of young young girls, it was pretty obvious, you know, the harms that might come to them through, you know, lots of online use. But I suppose I'm interested in what hasn't been, um, uh, what hasn't come to market yet, you know what I mean, the, the, the digital initiatives. And we've heard evidence written and otherwise, on the one hand, that we should be um, or, or somebody should be scanning venture capital and private equity, you know, more effectively, follow the money, if you like, um, you know, because in a sense, if the money is there, then that, you know, those new technologies might come to market. And at the other end, um, <clears throat> I think, Sally, you mentioned academia, and, and I was just wondering whether you think that that regulators' relationship with university research is strong enough. I was um, reading some of our evidence and uh, about Georgetown University's Fortel platform, which concentrates on scanning um, security technology sector, and they use AI, and they do it at huge scale. That sounds interesting as well. I mean, on this point of what is coming next, and maybe you'd like to kind of comment on that. <coughs> You can certainly use technology for horizon scanning. I mean, and, and following venture capital, there's a lot of money that goes into funding horizon scanning. Um, but horizon scanning for the purposes of consumption by specific users. So, for example, horizon scanning on the change of regulation. Um, the relationship with academia, I think it very much depends on whether the programs are in place or not. Um, so... I think Rachel and I actually don't disagree in the sense that you can think about horizon scanning in certain areas effectively, mm -hmm. but doing it as, a, as an approach that tackles the whole universe of things that could change. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's I would, not possible. I would agree, no. Exactly, that's yeah. not possible. Um, I think my position around horizon scanning is very much a, a pragmatic one, which is horizon scanning is necessary in sectors of deep expertise when we're looking at certain areas but it shouldn't detract from doing okay i'm i'm conscious of time but my last quick question and, and rachel i'll start with you on this um wh when we heard from the drcf they mentioned a piece of horizon scanning work that was going to invite significant public engagement um they didn't define what that was but it seems to be in the pipeline um but once, assuming it goes ahead and once it's completed, um, what mechanisms can you see for feedback to the public and, for that matter, government and parliament, you know, in order to inform public policy issues? What, what kind of mechanism would you see for that? I mean, in, um, in the public sentiment work that I've done previously to understand how people think about technology... I think one of the things we have to come to terms with is that mostly people don't want to have to think about it. You know, we are using technology as a thing to make our lives easier. Mm -hmm. We are not using it because every time we uh, swipe right on our phone, we want to understand the underlying mechanisms. It's a, you know, and so I think there's an extent to which... Um, Back to what I was saying at the beginning about having a vision of what the world can be, I think there's much more productive things that can be done in terms of asking and giving people more permission to co-create a, a future rather than, I think, sometimes public engagement can focus in on questions that are of interest to legislators that are not quite the way people understand the world yeah. and I think that the disconnect between those two things is very important to resolve and I think as well we're sort of at this kind of odd moment where there's quite a lot of a theatre of public engagement and that actually what doesn't really happen as much is accountability over time. And so I think what I would be more interested in is what does that accountability look like? 
And I think the last piece is that there's a, like, at the moment, the narrative in the media, particularly about Facebook, you know, and I'm not a fan of the Facebook or um, Meta, as they're now called, um, but a huge amount of that is driven, I think, by animosity from media companies, you know, whose lunch has been eaten again and again, mm. and that actually we're not really getting to a constructive story overall. And so I think there's a few different levers for, for change there. Thank you very much. That's hugely useful. And hand back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, Banis Bull next, then Banis Stowell, then we'll move on. Banis Bull. Thank you. And, and Rachel may have picked up on some of this. So horizon scanning seems to be not only about scanning for new technologies, but it's got to be about scanning for behaviour change. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so uh, I, I guess my interest is in how much one can scan the next generation for what they're doing. Because is the assumption, the regulators are, I mean, you're very young, but you're, we're all of a certain age, aren't we? Um, uh, but, uh, but in fact, is there an assumption that young people will graduate onto platforms that older people use, or that they will adapt and tweak and find ways to use the platforms they're using now in different ways? How much do we need to scan what young people are doing in order to understand unintended actually consequences isn't the right word but unintended uses of platforms in different ways which they may then take forward and use differently as adults in ways we can't anticipate so it was a rather convoluted question i hope it made sense i don't know sally i think <clears throat> i think that's why my starting point was horizon scanning is very difficult because so so in in our business we we on purpose hire multiple generations and you will be surprised at the gap between the 40-year-old and the 30-year-old. And you'll be very surprised about the gap, huge. And the gap between the 27-year-old and the 25-year-old. Of course, you can't hire an 8-year-old. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a challenge. But, but I tell you, I look at my daughter, who is four, and, and it, it, that, that generational understanding is absolutely necessary because the gap is getting bigger yeah. and the age is getting shorter and Facebook is for old people yeah. Yeah. it's a very well known fact yeah. and new platforms are coming, on, on, coming up on a regular basis so how do you predict the behaviour of younger generations I'd leave that to behavioural scientists <laughs> not sure you can I mean I'd add that actually one way to think about it is to think about public space and and the way that different generations use public space and the way that you segue through different modes of behaviour at different times and I think there's something about um, one of the things that um, defines I think a lot of the discourse about particularly the safety at the moment is kind of generalised anxiety about what people under 18 are doing because people who are sitting in rooms like this don't understand it. But that has always been the case. Mm. That is life. And I think, you know, there is an extent to which there's a, a kind of magic in not knowing and that's where the change and the creativity and the next thing comes from and I do worry um, you know while there may be all kinds of potential um, democratic harms that arise from TikTok's algorithms and their content targeting isn't it lovely that people are uh, uh, singing songs together right which is not a thing that anybody thought was possible and I suppose I guess I would just say it's good to lean in to the optimistic parts of that rather than kind of entirely hope to close it down can I add something on the again on Rachel's point about opportunities of horizon scanning um, 
and uh, forgive me, I need to take you on a bit of a journey. <laughs> so um, in financial services regulation, it, you know, it became very obvious that there's a lot of data out there and you need to regulate a world that is heavily financed, that is international, that is cross-border, that, that most people don't quite understand. So from that perspective, there's a little bit of parallel and, and we accept that that is, that is okay. That it's okay that we have to have you know, financial services regulators that go into the detail and the public doesn't really get into that level. One thing that we, in, on the opportunity side of, of digital regulation, is that we're talking about regulating systems. Systems are easier to regulate than people. Systems can be regulated by systems, and again, there's a precedent in financial services, which is circuit breakers on the trading floor. Mm. You know, when, when algorithms start shorting um, stock, the circuit breakers kick in and it stops. Wouldn't it be wonderful on the opportunity side if we started thinking about implementing digital regulation digitally so that we prevent harm from happening? And there are mechanisms out there, they do exist. We've been working with them at, at UCL, um, the air platform that regulation developed that is funded by Innovate UK is specifically to prevent the sharing of data before it happens. There are instances out there, there are lots of people in the technology space that are thinking about this. And wouldn't it be wonderful to have them at the table? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Baroness Stowe, then we'll move on. Um, it was just briefly to, to go back to something which Rachel said a little while ago when you were saying about uh, regulating uh, the underlying aims. And I just wanted to just probe that and just check, are you suggesting that it would be possible to regulate uh, aims, as in, you know, to, to licence, as it were, an organisation, um, you know, as, as sort of, um, you know, fit to operate on the basis of trying to deliver on an aim, or, or, or was that just something that you were just sort of just putting out there as a, I mean, as a wishful thinking type thing? <laughs> so if you look at, if you look at, how technology products are made what you will see is for instance lots of companies in the, uh, the valley will use a thing called OKRs which are objectives and key results and so for every feature in every product there is a list of objectives and key results and those objectives are not tested against anything other than the potential to deliver a uh, uh, shareholder value and in a way that is an extraordinary opportunity for, for transparency there's almost no other industry that atomizes their objectives at um, that level now of course I, 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 I cannot imagine there would be willingness to, to cooperate, co cooperate at that level of transparency but I think what it speaks to is a, a, a kind of general air of uh, kind of pretend um, naivety and wanting to pull the wool over people's eyes when some of the larger companies say well we could never have anticipated this outcome because those the objectives have been very clearly laid out and so I think there is an opportunity there um, it is perhaps a less readily understandable op opportunity than regulating content, but I think it's certainly possible to a degree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lord Lipsy, move us on. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to lower the tone a bit because I want to change from horizon scanning and the theoretical stuff to the act actual practical doing by a body like the... Uh, DRCF. I mean, we had them all. We have four representatives in before us, and they told us how magnificently everything was coordinated, and they were very persuasive. Well, I went away and thought about it. I thought, here is a body which doesn't have a chair of its own, a non executive chair or anybody, it just consists of representatives of the regulator. It doesn't have any statutory powers whatsoever, and the regulators can do what they will with what it does. It has a minute staff, which as I understand it is entirely drawn between existing from existing regulators, and anyway doesn't include certainly more than 
there are more people who aren't represented on that body who are regulating than people on that body who are regulating, starting with the ASA and then going through to Z. And so my question really is, can a system of this kind possibly be effective even if you give it the right objectives and the right foresight? I'm happy. Sorry, I, I, either of you, just help. <laughs> Not the lawyers. <laughs> um, so um, I think it's a forum, not a regulator body, at least from what I understand. So it is a body for coordination, not for regulation. Um, and with that in mind, um, it's not open to everybody and not everybody has a seat at the table. So it's a forum for sharing knowledge. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. I have had interactions with them. I think I will leave it at that. Um, so I would say that I think it's probably a very useful and administrative thing. And to the points that were raised earlier about um, sharing information at all levels, I think it's a very positive step towards that. But I think, for instance, the sorts of issues that they're looking at in the work plan are very instrumental. You know, and so I think it's so obviously very early days. It's only you know been around for just over a year. Um, it feels like a very useful administrative body, but I, you know, I certainly think there is a a need for something rather more than coordinating that um, looks beyond the the sum of the parts, you know, and and calls those parts data, content, safety, privacy, whatever they are. Not least because. Um, I think as a member of the public, it's not going to get you anywhere. You know, I, I think the public still do need a front door for um, redress. They need to know where to go to. And I think that is unlikely to be a coordinating body at this time. So what sort of body should it be to decide where to go? I mean, I was, uh, funnily enough, I was grappling with this yesterday because somebody sent me an email out of the blue uh, without any permission flogging me a financial product. And I couldn't quite decide whether to go to the FCA or to the Information Commissioner, both of whom had a, a role in this. I mean, should there be a central clearinghouse for people who wish to complain, and should that be based around the DCF or be separate? I mean, I, I think nobody really loves the idea of there being more and more and more reg, um, regulatory bodies. I think the DCF could be the base from which other things grow. There's a huge amount of potential and opportunity there. But I think, in a way, what it is there to do at the moment is um, the very um, detailed job of organising and coordinating, and that I think there is a different skill set that is needed that could, I, I think, be built on top of that to be public the thing. But I think to your earlier point, to do that, it would need to encompass a larger number of regulators. Okay. And yet the, 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 the thought I have on this, I mean, I think it illustrates a, a, a sort of wider part of the problem here, which is we, we, look at a, we look at a problem and we think that's a content problem or that's a data problem um, or you know, that's a competition problem and that is for this regulator to deal with. That's why we've got an online safety bill that is basically the Ofcom bill. Um, it's about what Ofcom might do in the area of online safety Whereas arguably an important remedy and an important tool is competition policy. And the fact that these platforms have become huge, that people don't have any choice but to use them in, in order to engage with their friends, have to do it on the terms and conditions set by those platforms. And that could be, they could create a much, much safer environment for themselves if they could take them away from the, the, the platform's terms and conditions and create their own environment. But that's about competition policy, about sort of envisaging something like open banking. And because we're looking at it as an Ofcom problem rather than a competition problem. 
we are not using all of the available regulatory tools in a joint sort of way. So is there, is there as well as the coordination, as well as the sort of cooperation between these bodies in sort of horizon scanning and understanding what's happening, is there, it, should they not be working together to address these problems using all of their tools rather than individually? And should Parliament government be thinking, I want to address these societal problems using all of these regulatory approaches rather than handing it to one regulator? I guess that's what we're sort of, that's where he might play a more powerful role. There is certainly a vacuum in the regulator space for all things digital. Piecemeal regulation when... So, so of course, if DCMS is looking at something, it looks at it from the perspective of DCMS. If the FCA is looking at it, it looks at it from the perspective of the FCA. The FCA would not look to take action uh, against a digital platform that had nothing to do with financial services. It wouldn't understand their business model. Yeah. There's certainly a vacuum. Um, and negative jurisdiction is where the consumer falls. So I think that's the, 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 the problem that we're talking about. Um, forums for coordination will always be necessary amongst, amongst multiple regulators. But if the question is about the vacuum, um, yes, but please not going down the route of regulating activities like Europe is going because that would be disastrous for the innovation, mm. um, for innovation in the UK. Absolutely disastrous. You, it, think about the seed companies, the companies that are, that are just two individuals that are developing a piece of code out of university when they're collaborating with a company. If they were asked to register a business and, and follow a code of conduct at that stage and seek authorization, that would be the death knell for them. So um, at an appropriate time, certainly, through registration or anything else, but um, that, that and, and actually that's the point. There needs to be that kind of thinking being done independently of the areas that the current regulators already regulate. Thank you. Rachel. I, <clears throat> so I would look particularly to some of the problems with the proposals in the um, data a strategy that's currently open for consultation, uh, in which the role of the, the, uh, the CO is, is, is recommended to be enhanced. And, you know, if, if we, the, propo the proposals in there would, would consider the information commissioner as being potentially an arbiter of uh, uh, fairness. Uh, around potentially issues like employment law, you know, the use of, our, of, our, of algorithms in employment, um, in education, in uh, finance. And that actually, I think what that speaks to is there needs to be a much, um, a much more um, sophisticated way of joining together expertise, you know, on the one hand, I would totally advocate that the EHRC develops more technical capability. But whether, you know, like the, there's something about the, at the moment, everything is being uh, diced up very finely. And there are certain issues that are complex and interrelated. And I think one of the other things that needs to happen is that the way that a technology will roll out in a society and the people who are impacted by it, you know, it won't happen tomorrow that we will wake up and everybody will, I don't know, have a self-driving car or a workplace monitoring program. But a, a certain people will. You know, and that I think there needs to be actually, I think it's very easy to think about horizon the scanning as something that's happening in the um, distance. But we can be looking at the harms that are incurred to particularly um, minoritized communities. We can be looking at 
the ways that certain <coughs> technologies roll out as edge cases. And I think using those as case studies to think more deeply about what uh, greater uh, um, harmonisation between re um, regulatory authorities looks like. Thank you. Can I just go, come back, ask you to come back on just a slightly different? You may not. Have, this may not be something you've given thought to. Um, you, you're describing both of you are describing judgments on societal issues. Um, somebody has to balance these issues, work out where the harm is, maybe balance innova innovation against sort of regulation thresholds. Um, have you thought about where Parliament fits into this? Because Parliament, what is happening is Parliament is increasingly giving very broad powers to regulators, because it's the only way to deal with the very fast-moving digital world that we live in. Um, and then sort of Parliament sort of looks at it again in five years' time when another piece of legislation comes along. Do you, do you see some danger in the kind of societal judgments that you've talked about being made by regulators rather than by Parliament? That's a good question. I mean, I, I think um, yes and. You know, the, this is an area where I think we need to look for more continuum the process, and that actually, um, you know, I, I, I've brought I've um, brought it up a couple of times, but if we if we look at 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 the general discourse about Facebook at the moment, if you speak to people who work in technology rights, if you spoke to them at any point in the last 20 years, none of these things would have been a, a surprise to them. They would have all been arising. And I th think that there is something about what is the moment at which a thing is, is, is taken uh, 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 seriously. And I think there's another, there's another problem in the deep up mental structure in government, which doesn't really reflect accurately, I think, the way that technology is a social and economic a political force. And, I, and so it's not just about the role of parliament, but I think of policy more generally and listening, I think. Thank you. To consider the question a little bit more, <clears throat> um, technical committees would certainly be welcome as a as an external, because also the external perspective is useful. Um, it a regulator becomes very focused on what they're doing, um, and I think there was a follow up. Did you? Well, I was just going to ask if, I, if it's helpful. So right at the beginning, you both talked about um, talking about a future world that we want to live in. That won't be the focus of regulators, will it? No. It's not in their DNA. I can say that. I can be a little bit more blunt. Um, regulators tend to exist to regulate, mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking about the bigger picture. So um, financial services regulation does have a precedent. So if you see the agenda of sustainability started being pushed by the Bank of England several years ago yeah. and, and implementing that and, and making sure that the right framework is in place for the banks to fund sustainable initiatives. So regulators do increasingly play a part in societal and, and financial stability is societal. Mm. Um, I think it, it, they're, they're highly technical areas and, and having that kind of deep technical expertise does mean that going into horizon scanning again and talking about having frameworks in place, they can do the horizon scanning in their area of expertise to a deep enough level where they would have enough information. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't also have checks and balances. Yeah. I would add, if, if yeah. it's okay, that... that if we, if we think about the role of military innovation um, in the technologies we use every day, there was an extent of foresight, there was an extent to which people were thinking about novel uses of tools in the world. 
um, that may seem very remote from everyday life, but it is absolutely a part of, you know, our, our, our phones that we're carrying around every day, you know. And so th this th thinking is happening. I think it very often is happening through a lens of uh, the security rather than the possibility. And I think there's an opportunity to to, op to open it up. Okay. So on the opportunity side as well, um, if I'm a new technology company and I'm not certain what regulation applies to me, I'm in a situation of vacuum. So having a go-to body that I can ask my questions about what do I need to be careful of is actually a positive towards innovation. So regulation isn't necessarily a <laughs> negative. Yeah. yeah. Something can guide you through all of the avenues rather than just from the perspective of one regulator that you've got to keep happy. That's it. And, and even for the regulators themselves, because, again, being a technology company, um, we often talk to lots of regulators and none of them would have the right... Um, it wouldn't fall within their remit. Yeah. And then sometimes they would have to refer to each other. Great. Thank you. Right, we'd better move on. Uh, that was very uh, interesting. Uh, the Bishop of Worcester. Thank you, uh, Chair. Th thank you. Can I say thank you, first of all, very much indeed for your evidence, which has been really um, helpful and, and interesting. And I'm particularly grateful to you for, for uh, making us, at the beginning, concentrate on, on the positive influence that technology can and does have uh, towards human flourishing and, and the common good. And, and I think it's really important for us to remember that. Um, I mean, it seems to me that technology is it, it's morally neutral. I mean, like water, we, we need it to survive, but we can drown in it. Um, but it's, it's up to us to make good use of it. But to, the, the pendulum swings to, from fear to <coughs> thinking it's, um, it's, it's the answer to everything. And, and we, the, the regulation thing does tend to keep us, uh, as you say, focusing upon the dangers, which is, which is necessary. I mean, it seems to me that if, if it's not in the DNA of regulators to think about uh, the, the effects, then it is the role of parliaments to, to uh, seek through legislation uh, uh, the very best for society as a whole. Um, but if we're thinking about flourishing in the common good, um, I, I want us to, th to, to, to look a little bit at, at the international situation. I mean, different societies have different interpretations, shall we say, of uh, what human flourishing is. Um, and, and I'm wanting to ask about the extent to which international corporations necessary to effective regulation. When um, Stephen Armand of the ICO spoke to the committee um, earlier this month, he, he pointed out rather obviously that um, digital actors are, are act operating in a borderless digital world and regulators therefore need to have very solid relationships with our international partners, assuming everyone can be thought of as a partner. Um, but um, I'm, I'm wondering, he says this is a, an area of active pursuit for the DRCF, I'm, I'm wondering what, what you would want to say about uh, the, the international situation um, and, and how whatever uh, develops here need, needs to relate to it. I'm, I'm really interested by the, the analogy you're, you're making between digital services um, re regulation uh, and, and what might be possible as, uh, as far as digital services are concerned. So can, can I start with you, Sally? Okay. Um, international, so, so technology amplifies the international aspect of business. Um, in today's world, every business is ultimately international. So again, financial services, money is cross-border, it moves freely. And um, the, the regulation around data sharing actually hinders the sharing of information about fraud. Both are necessary. The necessary it's necessary to protect the, the data, but it's also necessary to achieve the purpose of uh, international data sharing. So, um, and, and again, if we go back into the, the if we have a, something to compare against, um, standard setters are international bodies. Financial services regulation starts out through standard setters, which are international bodies, where all the regulators would sit. Best practice would be developed and would be implemented across the, the national legislation with some differences. Um, in the technology space, um, 
there is still the aspect of, uh, and this is this is already in fintech, and, and again, this is all my perspective, obviously. But in fintech, there's a race to see who's going to, which economy is going to um, attract uh, fintech startups before others, because that generates GVA, obviously. But they still abide by international standards of regulation that applies to, so there's a level playing field, if you like. And it's that level playing field that we need to be talking about. Um, in the absence of a regulator, we don't have a single voice on those matters. And can, can I just, before I ask you, you mentioned, you said just a moment ago, don't, don't go the way of Europe. Uh, I mean, that, that shows that, that there will be tensions internationally with, with, with what Certainly. is appropriate. And, and how, how possible is it to, to, to get through those in a constructive manner as, as generally seems to be the case with financial services? Um, through discussions, through international bodies. I mean, the EU has also, is also looking to regulate AI ethics ahead of everybody else. So the EU usually does lean in that direction. Um, and there are positives and negatives, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then it becomes a matter of um, negotiation and discussion. And you find that, again, the forums are, are usually include regulators that talk to each other because you, you, you've got, you have to have the level, the discussion not at a, at a ma macro, completely macro, but probably at, same as horizon scanning, you can't go very general, you've got to go sectoral, it'll probably be the same thing, at least from my perspective, if you want to have a constructive conversation. Otherwise you start talking about fishing rights and all of that in a very general way, which doesn't really get you to an, to an agreement. And as far as digital services are concerned, it the, the whole area is in its infancy as compared with very much so. financial services. Yeah. Very, very much so. So, and, and I think that is the biggest challenge for the next 10 years. It's, it's in its infancy. It, think about, you know, we take corporations for granted, but in that, that had to be created legally. We had to create a legal personality for a corporation, for a company. That had to happen at one point. In the, in the legal circuits, I think we're talking about um, algorithms having a legal personality so that they can have a balance sheet and, you know, etc. We really are in the infancy of how we regulate and deal with technology in terms of our legal infrastructure. Um, I would come from a slightly different place, uh, which is to say that I think it's worth differentiating between the methods and I think it's absolutely worth joining up in terms of methods um, because, you know, as uh, Sally was saying, lots of this is very hard, um, very new. The more collaboration there is, the more likely that effective methods will be developed. I think it's worth was saying as well that, that kind of generally, I think in the UK, one of the reasons we're in a bit of a, a pickle generally with all of this is that <clears throat> there's kind of another point about, um, you know, we've inherited many communications technologies from the um, um, US, which is a country that, that has different um, standards, different approaches to um, the freedom of speech and that I think there has been a certain degree of equivocation over time in terms of what might be regarded as um, modern and innovative and that we, we need to take on and what is maybe at a you know, potentially, and this is at a legislative level, n not appropriate in in the context in the context of uh, the freedom of speech. I think particularly, and so I think collaboration is great, but I I think we have a harder job to do, which is about actually kind of clearly expressing political will about what it is we would like to achieve and if that doesn't happen everything else is sort of um, running around I think really um, also speaking about the different roles that a regulator would play versus a government um, you will see that 
you know, tech companies are the biggest companies in the world. They don't spend enough on taxes in Europe. Um, when the government is the one negotiating, then that comes into play. When a regulator is negotiating around ethics of an industry, it's the ethics that they talk about, and that's the standards that they go into. So I think, it, again, it's a, it's a governance point. Who is going to represent us in those discussions is very important. Okay. Okay. Uh, very briefly, then, Baroness Featherstone. Uh, then it, is, it is briefly, and it's, it's a bit off piece a bit. Uh, it's just the, the opening remark about looking forward, not looking back, if I may. Um, because I, I got a head full of stuff that Baroness uh, Kidron has been putting into my head, head of a private member's bill that she's bringing before us on Friday. And um, she says that one of the most important things when looking at technology in general, is to ask the question, how hasn't this concern figured in all the legislation we've done thus far? Talking, of course, about age accuracy. Um, is there a mechanism, a way, as both the evolution of technology and the need to regulate what's emerging happens, is there a way of asking the question, what's not here? What, what have we missed because in the, in, in, all the legislation on the statute that affects every aspect of our lives in society is missing the element of age accuracy. And now we have to, and she's trying to get this into thinking going forward. So isn't that a case where the past actually is informative um, as we look at how we do things now and in the future? Um, I think that what is interesting here is is as much about who who is a part of um, scrutiny actually I think I, I don't know that it is much about looking at what has happened in the past because I think it a lot of it is about understanding what is happening now and I think a lot of effort could be spent on mending um, um, theoretical examples in the past whereas actually there may be different democratic mechanisms to make it easier for civil the society to be a part of um, scrutinising and holding uh, legislation and policy to account and I, I say that particularly in the current context and that of the last couple of years in which the the policy calendar is very unpredictable and there can be huge clusters of things that come out together which means it's very easy for those who are outside of parliament to miss things that are um, legitimately uh, shared before consultation. And so, you know, much much as I hate to say it, I don't know that I agree with Baroness Children. Yes, but that will be unusual, but... Um, <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think it's... You're, you're, you're talking about the process of... So we, we observe society and then we legislate. Um... And, and that is the normal process. And of course you miss things because it's just how it happens. And, and I think that's an argument towards having a central regulator for me because if you think about... Um, a central... A regulator for digital, for all things digital. Because if you look at the powers that... And again, forgive me, it's my background, which is financial services. If you look at the powers of the financial services regulators, they're very broad. It's protect the consumer. And therefore, then they have to develop how they do that. And that would be a mechanism for resolving that situation. Thank you. Baroness Featherstone. Yeah, I, I, I might have got the wrong end of the stick. It wouldn't be the first time. Um, but Rachel, I, I think at the beginning you said something about the really the all-powerful thing was the business model. So would you want that to be regulated? And in what way? I mean, the, the thing is, is that um, if 
quite often at the moment, the harms that we see related to business models, many of them can be attributed to um, murders and acquisitions, you know, and so there's a monopoly element, absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely. But then if we think about, for instance, particularly with algorithmic technologies like, and the way they're rolled out in things like currently um, universities, for instance, for uh, the surveillance, you know, there is a question about is that business model appropriate? Mm-hmm. Is it ethical? Is, is it up to the individual purchaser um, or procurer to make that choice, or do there need to be protections elsewhere? I think I'm agreeing with you. Carry on, then. Well, no, I mean, that's the, you know, it's, it's, it's that actually maybe it's, it's, a hard, it's a harder lever, you know, it involves a different kind of scrutiny, it involves a different kind of expertise, it is a bit less easy to generate headlines in the papers, but I think it's... ...that allows everyone to do what they want. You know, that the drivers are not necessarily a public good. No, absolutely. Thank you. Um, look, I'm afraid we, I think we need to leave it there. Um, Rachel Coltcutt, um, Sally uh, Sphere Tate, thank you both very much indeed for your evidence. It's very useful and... Um, you know, yeah, I think you've, you've, you've given us a lot to think about and you've given us some new areas of thinking as well that we will need to explore further with other witnesses. But really appreciate the time you've given us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The proceeding is currently suspended.